this is Zadi Abug, and today we are continuing with our reading of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Chapter 15. Such was the history of my beloved cottagers that impressed me deeply. I learned from the views of social life which it developed to admire their virtues and to deprecate the vices of mankind. As yet I looked upon crime as a distant evil, benevolence and generosity were ever present before me, and setting with me desire to become an actor in the busy scene where so many admirable qualities were called forth and displayed. But in giving an account of the progress of my intellect, I was not a bit a circumstance which occurred in the beginning of the month of August of the same year. One night during my accustomed visit to the neighboring wood, where I collected my own food and brought home firing for my protectors, I found on the ground a leather portmanteau containing several articles of dress and some books. I eagerly seized the prize and returned with it to my hovel. Fortunately, the books were written in the language, the elements of which I had acquired at the cottage. They consisted of Paradise Lost, a volume of Pletcher's Lives, and the Sorrows of Murder. The possession of these treasures gave me extreme delight, and now I continually studied and exercised my mind upon these histories while my friends were employed in their ordinary occupations. I can hardly describe to you the effect of these books. They produced in me an affinity of new images and feelings that sometimes raised me to ecstasy, but more frequently sunk me into the lowest dejection. The sorrows of order, besides the interest of its simple and affecting story, so many opinions were canvassed, and so many lights thrown up what had been hitherto been to be obscure subjects, that I found it a never-ending source of speculation and astonishment the gentle and domestic manners it described combined with the lofty sentiments and feelings, for which had their object something out of itself, accorded well with my experience among my protectors, and with the wants which were forever alive in my own bosom. But I thought Werner himself a more divine being than I had ever beheld or imagined. His character contained no pretension, but it sank deep. The disquotations upon death and suicide were calculated to fill me with wonder. I did not pretend to enter into the merits of the case, and I inclined towards the opinion of the hero, whose extinction I wept without precisely understanding it. As I read, however, I applied much personality to my own feelings and condition. I found myself similar yet at the same time, strangely unlike to the beings concerning whom I read and to whose conversation I was a listener. I sympathized with and partly understood them, but I was uniformed in mind. I was dependent on none and related to none. The path of my departure was free, and there was none to lament my annihilation. My person was hideous, and my stature gigantic. What did this mean? Who was I? What was I? Whence did I came? Where was my destination? These questions continually reoccurred, but I was unable to solve them. The volume of Plutarch's Lives, which I possess, contained the histories of the first founders of the ancient republics. The book had a far different effect on me from the sorrows of Werner. I learned from Werner's imaginations, despondency, and gloom, but Plutarch taught me high thoughts. He elevated me above the wretched sphere of my own reflections to admire and love the heroes of past ages. Many things I read surpassed my understanding and experience. I had a very confused knowledge of kingdoms, wide extents of country, mighty rivers, and boundless seas, but I was perfectly unacquainted with towns and large assemblies of men. The cottage of my protectors had been the only school in which I had studied human nature, but this book developed new and mightier senses of action. I read of men concerned in public affairs, governing or massacring their species. I felt the greatest ardor for virtue rise within me, and a horribleness for vice, as far as I understood the significance of those terms, relative as they were, as I applied them to pleasure and pain alone. Induced by these feelings, I was of course led to admire peaceful lawgivers, Noma Solon and Lycurus, in preference to Romeus and Thesis. The patriarchal lives of my protectors caused these impressions to take a firm hold on my mind, perhaps just by my first introduction to humanity had been made by a young soldier burning for glory and slaughter, I should have been imbued with different sensations. The Paradise Lost excited different and far deeper emotions. I read it as I had read the other volumes which had fallen into my hands as a true history. It moved every feeling of wonder and awe that the picture of an omnipotent god warring with his creatures was capable of exciting. I often referred to several situations as their similarity struck me to my own. Like Adam, I was apparently united by no link to any other being in existence, 
but his state was far different from mine in every other respect. He had come forth from the hands of a god, a perfect creature, happy and prosperous, guarded by the special care of his creator. He was allowed to converse with and acquire knowledge for beings of a superior nature. I was wretched, helpless, and alone. Many times I considered Satan as the fitter emblem of my condition, for often like him, when I viewed the bliss of my protectors, the bitter gall of envy rose within me. Another circumstance strained and confirmed these feelings. Soon after my arrival in the hovel, I discovered some papers in the pocket of the dress which I had taken from your laboratory. At first I had neglected them, but now that I was able to decipher the characters in which they were written, I began to study them with diligence. It was your journal of the four months that preceded my creation. You minutely described in these papers every step you took in the progress of your work. This history was mingled with accounts of domestic occurrences. You doubtless recollect these papers. Here they are. Everything is related in them, which bears reference to my accused origin. The whole detail of that series of disgusting circumstances, which produced and upset you, the minutest description of my odious and loathsome person is given, a language which painted your own horrors and rendered mine indelible. I sickened as I read. Hateful day when I received life, I exclaimed in agony. A curse of greater, why did you form a monster so hideous that even you turned from me in disgust? God, in pity, may man beautiful and alluring, after his own image. My form is a filthy type of yours, even more horrid from their very resemblance. Satan has his companions, fellow devils, to admire and encourage him, but I am solitary and abhorred. These were rude reflections of my hours of despondence and solitude, of what I contemplated, the virtues of the cottagers, their amiable and benevolent dispositions, I persuaded myself that when they should become acquainted with my admiration of their virtues, they would compassion me and look, overlook my personal deformity. How could they turn from their door one, however monstrous, who solicited their compassion and friendship? I resolved, at least, not to despair, but in every way to fit myself for an interview with them, which would decide my fate. I postponed this attempt for some months longer, for the importance attached to its success inspired me with a dread lest I should fail. Besides, I found that my understanding improved so much with every day's experience that I was unwilling to commence this undertaking until a few more months should have added to my sagacity. Several changes in the meantime took place in the cottage. The presence of Safi diffused happiness among its inhabitants. I also found that a greater degree of plenty reigned there. Felix and Agatha spent more time in amusement and conversation, and they were insisted in their labors by servants. They did not appear rich, but they were contented and happy. Their feelings were serene and peaceful, while mine became every day more tumultuous. The proofs of knowledge only discovered to me more clearly what a wretched outcast I was. I cherished hope, it is true, but it vanished when I beheld my person reflected in water or my shadow in the moonshine, even as that frail image on that inconstant shade. I endeavored to crush these fears and to fortify myself for the trial which in a few months I resolved to undergo, and sometimes I allowed my thoughts, unchecked by reason, to ramble in the fields of paradise, and dared to fancy amiable and lovely creatures sympathizing with my feelings and cheering my gloom. Their angelic countenances breathed smiles of consolation, but it was all a dream. No eve suited my sorrows nor shared my thoughts. I was alone. I remember Adam's supplication to his creator, but where is mine? He had abandoned me, and the bitterness of my heart I cursed him. Autumn passed thus. I saw, with surprise and grief, the leaves decay and fall, and nature again assumed a barren and bleak appearance, and I warned when I first beheld the woods and that lovely mood. Yet I did not heed the bleakness of the weather. I was better fitted by my confirmation for the endurance of cold than heat. But my chief delights were the sight of the flowers, the birds, and all the gay apparel of summer. When those deserted me, I turned with more attention towards the cottagers. Their happiness was not decreased by the absence of summer. They loved and sympathized with one another, and their joys, depending on each other, were not interrupted by the casualties that took place around them. The more I saw of them, the greater became my desire to claim their protection and kindness. My heart yearned to be known and loved by these amiable creatures, to see their sweet looks directed towards me with affection was the utmost limit of my ambition. I dared not think that they would turn them from me with disdain and horror. The poor that stopped at their door were never driven away. I asked, it is true, for greater treasures than a little food or rest. 
I required kindness and sympathy, but I did not believe myself utterly unworthy of it. The winter advanced, an entire revolution of the seasons had taken place since I awoke into life. My attention at this time was solely directed towards my plan of introducing myself into the cottage of my protectors. I revolved many projects, but that on which I finally fixed was to enter the dwelling when the blind old man should be alone. I had sagacity enough to discover that the unnatural hideousness of my person was the chief object of horror with those who had formerly beheld me. My voice, although harsh, had nothing terrible in it. I thought, therefore, that if the absence of his children, I could gain the goodwill and meditation of the old De Lacy, I might by his means be tolerated by my younger protectors. One day, when the sun shone on the red leaves that strewed the ground and diffused cheerfulness, although it denied warmth, Safi, Agatha, and Felix departed on a long country walk, and the old man, at his own desire, was left alone in the cottage. When his children had departed, he took up his guitar and played several mournful but sweet airs, more sweet and mournful than I had ever heard him play before. At first his countenance was illuminated with pleasure, but as it continued, thoughtfulness and sadness succeeded. At length, laying beside the instrument, he sat absorbed in reflection. My heart beat quick. This was the hour and moment of trial, which would decide my hopes or realize my fears. The servants were gone to a neighboring fair. All was silent in and around the cottage. It was an excellent opportunity, yet when I proceeded to execute my plan, my limbs failed me and I sank to the ground. Again I rose, and exerting all the firmness of which I had mastered, removed the planks that I had placed before my hovel to conceal my retreat. The fresh air revived me, and with renewed determination, I approached the door of the cottage. I knocked. Who's there? said the old man. Come in. I entered. Part of this intrusion, said I. I am a traveler in want of a little rest. You would greatly oblige me if you would allow me to remain a few minutes before the fire. Enter, said De Lacy. I will try in what manner I can to relieve your wants, but unfortunately my children are far from home, and as I am blind, I am afraid I shall find it difficult to procure food for you. Do not trouble yourself, my kind host. I have food. It is warm, and the rest is only what I need. I sat down, and a silence ensued. I knew that every minute was precious to me, and I remained irresolute in what manner to commence the interview. But the old man addressed me. By your willing, good stranger, I suppose you are my countryman. Are you French? No, but I was educated by a French family, and understand that language only. I am now going to claim the protection of some friends, whom I sincerely love, and whose favor I have some hopes. Are they German? No, they are French, but let us change the subject. I'm an unfortunate and deserted creature. I look around and have no relation or friend upon the earth. These amiable people, to whom I have go to, have never seen me and know little of me. I am full of fears, for if I fail there, I am an outcast in the world forever. Do not despair. To be friendless is indeed to be unfortunate. But the hearts of men, when unprejudiced by any obvious self-interest, are full of brotherly love and charity. Rely, therefore, on your hopes. A few friends are good and amiable, do not despair. They are kind. They are the most excellent creatures of the world, but unfortunately they are prejudiced against me. I have good disposition. My life has been hitherto harmless and some degree beneficial, but a fatal prejudice clouds their eyes, and where they often see a feeling and kind friend, they behold only a detestable monster. That is indeed unfortunate, but if you are really blameless, can you undeceive them? I am about to undertake that task, and it is on that account that I feel so many overwhelming terrors. I tenderly love these friends. I have, unknown to them, been for many months in the habits of daily kindness towards them, but they believe that I wish to injure them, and that is a prejudice which I wish to overcome. Where do these friends reside? Near the spot. The old man paused, then continued. If you will really unreservedly confide to me the particularities of your tale, I perhaps may be of use in undeceiving them. I am blind and cannot judge of your countenance, but there is something in your words which persuades me that you are sincere. I am poor and in exile, but it will afford me true pleasure to be in any way serviceable to a human creature. Excellent man, I thank you and accept your generous offer. You raised me from the dust by this kindness. I trust that by your aid I shall not be driven away from the society and sympathy of your fellow creatures. Heaven forbid, even if you are really criminal, 
for that you can only drive you to desperation and not instigate you to virtue. I also am unfortunate. I and my family have been condemned, although innocent, judged therefore, if I do not feel for your misfortunes. How can I thank you, my best and only benefactor? From your lips first, I have heard the voice of kindness directed towards me. I shall be forever grateful. Your present humanity assures me of success with those friends who am I on the point of meeting. May I know the names and residents of your friends? I paused. This, I thought, was the moment of decision, which was to rob me of or bestow happiness on me forever. I shrugged vainly, for firmness sufficient to answer him, but the effort destroyed all my remaining strength. I sank on the chair and sobbed out loud. At that moment, I heard the steps of my younger protectors. I had not a moment to use, but seizing the hand of the old man, I cried, Now is the time. Save and protect me. You and your family are the friends whom I seek. Do not you desert me at this hour of trial. Good great God, explained the old man. Who are you? At that instant, the cottage door was opened, and Felix, Safi, and Agatha entered. Who can describe their horrid concentration on beholding me? Agatha fainted, and Safi, unable to attend to her friend, rushed out of the cottage. Felix started forward, and with supernatural force tore me from his father, to whose knees I clung, and in a transport of fury, he dashed me to the ground and struck me violently with a stick. I could have torn him limb for blood, as the lion red the antelope, but my heart sank within me, as with bitter sickness, and I refrained. I saw him on the point of repeating his blow, when overcome by pain and anguish, I quitted the cottage, and in general tumult escaped unperceived by hovel. Chapter 16 Curse, curse, creator! Why did I live? Why, in that instant, did I not extinguish the spark of existence which you had so wantingly bestowed? I know not. Despair had not yet taken possession of me. My feelings were those of rage and revenge. I could with pleasure have destroyed the cottage and its inhabitants, and have glutted myself with their shrieks of misery. When night came, I quitted my retreat and wandered in the wood. But now, no longer restrained by fear of discovery, I gave vent to my anguish and fearful howl. I was like a wild beast that had broken the toils, destroying the objects that obstructed me, and raging through the wood with a stage-like swiftness. Oh, what a miserable night I passed! The cold stars shone in mockery, and the bare trees waved their branches above me. Now and then the sweet voice of a bird burst forth amidst the universal stillness. All save I were at rest or in enjoyment. I, like the archfiend, bore a hell within me, and finding myself unsympathized with, wished to tear up the trees, spread havoc and destruction around me, and then to have sat down and enjoyed the ruin. But this luxury of sensation that could not endure, I became fatigued with excess of bodily exertion, and sank on the damp grass in the sick impotence of despair. There was none among the myriads of men that existed who would pity or assist me. And should I feel kindness towards my enemies? No, from that moment I declared everlasting war against the species, and more than that, against him who had formed me and sent me forth to this insupportable misery. The sun rose, I heard voices of men, and knew that it was impossible to return to my retreat during that day. Accordingly, I hid myself in some thick underwood, determining to devote the stirring hours to reflection on my situation. The pleasant sunshine and pure air of the day restored me to some degree of tranquility, and when I considered what had passed at the cottage, I could not help believing that I had been too hasty in my conclusions. I had certainly acted imprudently. It was apparent that my conversation had interested the father in my behalf, and I was a fool in having exposed my person to the horror of his children. I ought to familiarize the old De Lacy to me, and by degrees to have discovered myself to the rest of his family, when they should have been prepared for my approach. But I did not believe my heirs to be irretrievable, and after much consideration, I resolved to return to the cottage, seek the old man, and by my representations, went him to my party. These thoughts calmed me, and in the afternoon I sank into a profound sleep, but the fever of my blood did not allow me to be visited by peaceful dreams. The horrible scene of the preceding day was forever acting before my eyes. The females were flying, and their enraged Felix tearing me from his father's feet. I awoke exhausted. Finding that it was already night, I crept forth from my hiding place and went in search of food. When my hunger was appeased, I directed my steps towards the well-known path that conducted to the cottage. All there was was at peace. I crept into my hovel and remained in silent expectation of the accustomed hour when the family arose. That hour passed. The sun mounted high in the heavens, but the cottagers did not appear. I trembled violently, apprehending some dreadful misfortune. They had said that the cottage was dark, 
and I heard no motion. I cannot describe the agony of the suspense. Presently, two countrymen passed by, but pausing near the cottage, they entered into conversation using violent gesticulations, but I did not understand what they said, as they spoke the language of the country, which differed from that of my protectors. Soon after, however, Felix approached with another man. I was surprised, as I knew that he had not quitted the cottage that morning, and waited anxiously to discover from his discourse the meaning of these unusual appearances. Do you consider, said his companion to him, that you will be obliged to pay three months' rent and to lose the produce of your garden? I do not wish to take any unfair advantage, and beg, therefore, that you will take some days to consider your determination. It is utterly useless, replied Felix. We can never again inhabit your cottage. The life of my father is in the greatest danger, owing to the dreadful circumstance that I have related. My wife and my sister will never recover from their horror. I entreat you not to reason with me any more. Take possession of your tenement, and let me fly from this place. Felix trembled violently as he said this. He and his companion entered the cottage, in which they remained for a few minutes, and then departed. I never saw any of the family of De Lacey more. I continued for the remainder of the day in my hovel in a state of utter and stupid despair. My protectors had departed, and had broken the only link that held me to the world. For the first time, the feelings of revenge and hatred filled my bosom, and I did not strive to control them, but allowed myself to be borne away by the stream. I bent my minds toward injury and death. When I thought of my friends, of the mild voice of De Lacey, the gentle eyes of Agatha, and the exquisite beauty of the Arabian, those thoughts vanished when a gust of tears somewhat suited me. But again, when I reflected that they had spurned and deserted me, anger returned, a rage of anger, and unable to injure anything human, I turned my fury towards inanimate objects. As night advanced, I placed a variety of combustibles around the cottage, and having destroyed every vestigial of cultivation in the garden, I waited with forced impatience until the moon had sunk to commence my operations. As night advanced, a fierce wind rose from the woods and quickly dispersed the clouds that had loitered in the heavens. The blast tore like a mighty avalanche and produced a kind of insanity in my spirits that burst all bounds of reason and reflection. I laid the dry branch of a tree and danced with fury around the devoted cottage, my eyes still fixed on the western horizon, at the edge of which the moon nearly touched. A part of its orb was at length hid, and I waved my brand. It sank. And with a loud scream, I fired the straw and heath and bushes which I had collected. The wind fanned the flame, and the cottage was quickly enveloped by the flames, which clung to it and licked it with their forked and destroyed tongues. As soon as I was convinced that no assistance could save any part of the habitation, I quitted the scene and sought for refuge in the woods. And now, with the world before me, whither should I bend my steps? I resolved to fly far from the scene of my misfortunes, but to me, Hated and despised, every country must be equally horrible. I like the thought of you crossed my mind. I have learned from your papers that you were my father, my creator, and to whom I could apply with more fitness than to him who had given me life. Among the lessons that Felix had bestowed upon Safi, geography had not been omitted. I have learned from these the relative situations of the different countries of the earth. You had mentioned Guetta as the name of your native town, and towards the place I resolved to proceed. But how was I to erect myself? I knew that I must travel in a southwesterly direction to reach my destination, but the sun was my only guide. I did not know the names of the town that I was to pass through, nor could I ask information from a single human being. But I did not despair. From you I could only hope for success, although towards you I felt no sentiment but that of hatred, unfeeling, heartless creator. You had endowed me with perceptions and passions, and they cast me abroad an object for the scorn and hatred of mankind. But on you only had I any claim for pity and redress, and from you I determined to seek that justice which I vainly attempted to gain from any other being that wore human form. My travelings were long, and the sufferings I endured intense. It was late in autumn when I quitted the district which I had so long resided. I traveled only at night, fearful of encountering the visits of a human being. Nature decayed around me, and the sun became heatless. Rain and snow poured around me. Mighty rivers were frozen, and the surface of the earth was hard and chill and bare, and I found no shelter. O oh, earth, how often did I impregnate curses on the cause of my being? The mildness of my nature had fled, and all within me was turned to gall and bitterness. 
the nearer I approached to your inhabitation, the more deeply did I feel the spirit of revenge and kindled in my heart. Snow fell, and the waters were hardened, but I rested not. A few incidents now and then directed me. I possessed the map of the country, but I often wandered wide from my path. The agony of my feelings allowed me no respite. No incident occurred for which my rage and mystery could not extract its food. But a circumstance that happened when I arrived on the confines of Switzerland, when the sun had recovered its warmth, and the earth again began to look green, confirmed in a special manner the bitterness and horror of my feelings. I generally rested during the day, and traveled only when I was secured by night from the view of man. One morning, however, finding that my path lay through a deep wood, I ventured to continue my morning, my journey after the sun had risen. The day, which was one of the first to spring, cheered even me by the loveliness of the sunshine and the balminess of the air. I felt emotions of gentleness and pleasure that had long appeared dead, revived within me. Half surprised by the novelty of these sensations, I allowed myself to be borne away by them, and forgetting my solitude and deformity, dared to be happy. Soft tears again be down my cheeks. I even raised my human eyes with thankfulness towards the blessed sun, which bestowed such joy upon me. I continued to wind among the paths of the wood, until I came to its boundary, which was skirted by deep and rapid woods river, into which many of the trees bent their branches, how budding with the fresh spring. Here, I paused, not exactly knowing what path to pursue, when I heard the sounds of voices that induced me to conceal myself under the shade of a cypress. I was scarcely hid when a young girl came running towards the spot where I was concealed, laughing, as if she ran from someone in sport. She continued her course along the persistent slides of the river, and when her foot slipped and she fell to the rapid stream, I rushed from my hiding place and with extreme labor from the force of the current saved her and dragged her to shore. She was senseless, and I endeavored by every means of my power to restore animation when I was suddenly interrupted by the approach of a rustic, who was probably the person from which she had playfully fled. On seeing me, darted towards me, and tearing the girl from my arms, passed towards the deepest part of the woods. I followed speedily. I hardly knew why, but when the man saw me draw near, he aimed a gun, which he carried at my body, and fired. I sank to the ground, and my injurer, with increasing swiftness, escaped into the woods. This was the reward of my benevolence. I had saved a human being from destruction. As a recompense, I now writhed under the miserable pain of a wound which shattered the flesh and bone, the feelings of kindness and gentleness which I had entertained but a few moments before, gave place to hellish rage and gnashing of teeth. Inflamed by pain, I vowed eternal hatred and vengeance towards all mankind, but the agony of my wounds overcame me. My pulses paused, and I fainted. For some weeks, I led a miserable life in the woods, endeavoring to cure the wound which I had received. The ball had entered my shoulder. I knew not whether it remained there or passed through. At any rate, I had no means of extracting it. My sufferings were augmented, also, by the oppressive sense of the injustice and gratitude of their infliction. My daily vows rose for revenge, a deep and deadly revenge, such as the world alone compensate for the outrageous and anguish I had endured. After some weeks, my wound healed, and I continued my journey. The labors I endured were no longer to be alleviated by the bright sun or gentle breezes of spring. All joy was but a mockery which insulted my desolate state and made me feel more painfully that I was not made for the enjoyment of pleasure. But my toils now drew near a close, and in two months from this time, I reached the environments of Guetta. It was evening when I arrived, and I retired to a hiding place among the fields, that surrounded it, to meditate in what manner I should apply to you. I was oppressed by fatigue and hunger, and far too unhappy to enjoy the gentle breezes of evening or the prospect of sun sitting behind the stupendous mountains of Jura. At this time, a slight sleep relieved me from the pain of reflection, which was disturbed by the approach of a beautiful child who came running into the recess I had chosen with all the sportiness of infancy. Suddenly, as I gazed on him, the idea seized me that this little creature was unprejudiced, and had lived too short a time to have admitted a horror of deformity. If, therefore, I could seize him and educate him as my companion and friend, I should not be so desolate in this peopled earth. Urged by this impulse, I seized on the boy as he passed and drew him towards me. As soon as he beheld my form, 
He placed his hands before his eyes and uttered a shrill scream. I drew his hand forcibly from his face and said, Child, what is the meaning of this? I do not intend to hurt you. Listen to me. You struggled violently. Let me go, he cried. Monster, ugly wretch, you wish to eat me and tear me to pieces. You are an ogre. Let me go or I will tell my papa. Boy, you will never see your father again. You must come with me. Hideous monster, let me go. My papa is a syndic. He is M. Frankenstein. He will punish you. You dare not keep me. Frankenstein, you belong to my enemy, to him towards whom I have sworn eternal revenge. You shall be my first victim. The child still struggled and loaded me with epithets, which carried the spirit to my heart. I grasped his throat to silence him, and in a moment he lay dead at my feet. I kissed on my victim, and my heart swelled with exultation and hellish triumph. Clasping my hands, I exclaimed, I too can create desolation. My enemy is not invulnerable. This death will carry despair to him and a thousand other miseries shall torment and destroy him. As I fixed my eyes on the child, I saw something glittering on his breast. I took it. It was a portrait of a most lovely woman. In spite of my malignity, it softened and attracted me. For a few moments, I gazed with delight on their dark eyes, fringed by deep lashes and her lovely lips. But my presently, my rage returned. I remembered that I was forever deprived of the delights that such beautiful creatures could bestow, and that she whose resemblance I contemplated would, in regarding me, have changed that air of divine benignity to one of expression of disgust and affright. Can you wonder that such thoughts transported me with rage? I often wonder that at that moment, instead of venting my sensations and exclamations of agony, I did not rush among mankind and perish in an attempt to destroy them. While I was overcome by these feelings, I left the spot where I committed the murder, and, seeking a more secluded hiding place, I entered a barn which appeared to me to be empty. A woman was sleeping on some straw. She was young, not indeed so beautiful as her whose portrait I held, but of an agreeable aspect and blooming in the loveliness of youth and health. Here, I thought, is one of those whose joy and parting smiles are bestowed on all but me. And then I bent over her and whispered, Awake, Ferris, thy lover is near. He would give his life but to obtain one look of affection from thy eyes my beloved awake the sleeper stirred a thrill of terror ran through me should she indeed awake and see me and curse me and denounce the murderer thus she would assuredly act and her darkened eyes opened and she beheld me the thought was madness and stirred the fiend within me not i but she shall suffer the murder i had committed because i am forever robbed of all that she could give me she shall atone the crime had its source in her, be hers the punishment. Thanks to the lessons of Felix and the sanguinary laws of man, I had learned not to work mischief. I bent over her and placed the portrait securely in one of the folds of her dress. She moved again, and I fled. For some days, I haunted the spot where these scenes had taken place, sometimes wishing to see you, sometimes resolved to quit the world and its miseries forever. At length I wandered towards these mountains, and have ranged through their immense recesses, consumed by a burning passion which you alone can gratify. We may not part until you have promised to comply with my requisition. I am alone and miserable. Man will not associate with me, but what is deformed and horrible as myself would not deny herself to me. My companion must be of the same species and have the same defects. This being you must create.